Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News, the most hard-hitting show on television. I'm your host, Rob Dew, and today's date is Monday, July 2nd, 2012, and here's a look at what we have coming up tonight. Tonight, the debt-fueled social welfare state marches in, and the Obama administration spends $3 million to convince us we will all live healthier lives if we just sign up for food stamps. Then, the Olympics whistleblower reveals his identity as he fears for his safety. And Rob Dew talks with Matthew Stein, the author of When Technology Fails, because there's never been a better time to be prepared. All that and more coming up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. That's right, there's no way of knowing when technology will fail or when disasters are gonna strike. So your best bet is to be prepared because it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Let's get to our top story. Olympics whistleblower fears for safety and he reveals his identity. I am now afraid that I might be in physical danger, says Lee Hazelton, the whistleblower who exposed how he infiltrated the G4S as, a, as an employee and uncovered how security preparations for the Olympics were so poor, they were inviting a terrorist attack. If you remember last week we had him on and one of the things he covered is that some of the workers were trying to sell drugs the, you know, to him, to other people. The supervisor didn't seem to care. They were talking about how they had an evacuation plan for London because of an extreme event that was gonna happen, one that would change, I think, I think they said change the face of London. So that interview is on the Alex Jones channel right now, and you can check that out. Or you can go back into the PrisonPlanet.tv archives if you're a member of PrisonPlanet.tv, which you should be if you're watching this right now. So check that out. Well, it's pretty interesting, and it's funny how when you get insiders in there and they come out and tell us the things that go behind closed doors. Now, I got some pictures I want to show you real quick. This is from a protest today. People were protesting Eric Holder. There's one there. Got justice? Hashtag fire holder. We've got another one coming up. Holder must go. Hey, this guy, he's black, so he must be a racist against Holder. I mean, that's the only obvious conclusion I could draw. Guns don't kill people. Holder does. There's a nice looking uh, young man there. All from the oh, wait, what's that? Oh, well, it's been, cl what, what happened to the protest? Where's the protest pictures? Oh, this is what happened. Secret Service disrupts students' fire holder protest over suspicious package. And this is out of campusreform.org. Josiah Ryan writes, The Secret Service on Monday shut down a student protest calling for the firing of Attorney General Herrick Holder, saying they were acting on concerns over a suspicious package left by a tourist on the White House grounds. So there you go. You leave a plastic bag, leave a paper sack, leave a backpack somewhere, automatically free speech is done. Get out, get out, move over here, okay? That's what you have to do, especially when the Secret Service is concerned because, you know, when they're not too busy drinking and hooking up with hookers, you know, they're looking out for paper bags. Paper bags are the problem out there. Not 50 students who were well-informed asking for uh, the president to fire Eric Holder for shipping guns to Mexico, trying to blame it on the Second Amendment. So kudos to campusreform.org for leading that protest and getting out there and going after the Grunions that are trying to devastate our country. Moving on to Bloomberg. Wash trading by high-frequency firms said to face U.S. scrutiny. Here's a milk toast headline, which I'm going to go over this article. This is out of Bloomberg. High-frequency trading firms are drawing scrutiny from U.S. regulators seeking evidence that they may have been distorting market prices by conducting transactions with themselves, said two people with knowledge of the matter. So-called wash trades in which a party buys a contract from itself could be executed, oh, I like this, inadvertently by firms with multiple algorithms active in the same stock or derivative. Right, they were making money and they had no idea how they were making money. Such trades can alter the price of shares if they are executed above or below market rates. It would be illegal if deemed intentional. And we move on. The Securities and Exchange Commission and Commodities Future Trading Commission have sharpened their focus on high-frequency algorithmic trading since 2010, when about $862 billion was erased from stock values in 20 minutes. Oh, my God. How do you do that in 20 minutes? But that was before the plunge protection team came in and 
help prop up the markets. Regulators have expressed concern that some firms' electronic exchanges don't have sufficient controls to prevent a range of events from improper trades to programming glitches. Okay, so there, there's your milk toast title from Bloomberg. Wars trading by high-frequency firms said to face U.S. scrutiny. Then about a week later, it comes out on this website, The Truth Is Now, computers on Wall Street are buying to themselves. There you go, buying and selling to themselves. So there, there's a headline that I want to read. This, this weak, watered-down Bloomberg headline doesn't make me want to read it, which is what Bloomberg wants. They don't want you to read stuff like this, because, the, and then they want to put words in there like, oh, it's unintentional, and they didn't know. Listen, they hire people right out of grad school, the, the smartest people in the world don't become scientists, they don't become educators, they don't become inventors, they go to Wall Street and learn how to steal from people. That's their job now, is to create little things that they write in their little code books that steal from people. So all the money that goes into these things, all the mom and pops that put their savings in, that gets erased. And I had an inside source, I talked to him today, and he gave me some information on how this works. He uses a little bit different terminology, um, but he said basically what happens is this, uh, they create these programs and then they, they kind of run on their own and they'll change the data sets every once in a while when they're not making money. So they'll, they'll make millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of transactions really quickly. And what happens is other firms see this stock going up a little bit. Oh, it, look, it looks like there's a lot of activity. I want to get in on that. So they get in on that. And then the people that have been buying and selling to themselves, creating that false uh, volatility or, or momentum, which may be just a few cents in the stock price, maybe fractions of pennies. They'll see that uh, once they buy into that stock, they get the other people to bait it, and, and then they'll sell it out for them, and they'll make a little bit, like maybe two or three cents, but they do this over and over again. So they might be making two or three pennies a second, but that's magnified over a million times. And so as the day goes on, they're making lots of money, and nothing's really happening, though. There's there, People aren't looking at the data of of how this company is doing. They're just looking at the volatility or how much action is going on in there. He says this is more than half the trading that goes on and it leads to more volatility. Uh, he talked about the 800 million uh, back in 2010. He said all major Wall Street firms and hedge funds are doing this and they're charging 60% of the profits made from this training, which is trading, which is way more than what they normally get. Usually they get about 30% or 20% plus a fee to run run the, the fund. But these guys are going in, they're taking 60% of the profits because this is so profitable. And they're running wild. And then Bloomberg comes out with this milk toast article. Oh, it's, it's glitches and programming errors. Yeah, right. Like, I believe that. Um, so, and then if, if the market starts to drop too bad, they have these things called circuit breakers, which come in and that came in in 08. They might suspend trading for half an hour. They may suspend it for an hour. And, um, he calls them quants, quantitative analysis, and they're quants hedge funds. And those are the people that are responsible for this. So you can use those buzzwords and look up and do your own research on it. Uh, they did this with the housing bubble. They were, they were packaging these housing loans into, into other little pieces, into other securities, and trading them over and over and over again to themselves now. But, of course, they had no idea it was going to happen. <sighs> Trying to go through this stuff real quick. But moving on, we're going to go now to pre-crime. Mr. Marks, by mandate of the District of Columbia Pre-Crime Division, I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks and Donald Dubin that was take place today, April 22nd, at 0800 hours, four minutes. No. Well, they don't jump through your windows yet for pre-crime. You know, they only jump through your windows if you're growing a little bit of pot or if you may have missed a payment here or there on your taxes, or at least they'll be doing that soon. But Yahoo News reports, sci-fi policing, predicting crime before it occurs. So LAPD is the largest agency to embrace an experiment known as predictive policing, which crunches data to determine where to send officers to thwart would-be thieves and burglars. Time Magazine calls it one of the best inventions of 2011. Early successes could serve as a model for other cash-strapped law enforcement agencies, but some legal observers are concerned that it may lead to unlawful stops and searches that violate the Fourth Amendment. No duh. Uh, Captain Sean Malinsky said, We have prevented hundreds and hundreds of people from coming home and seeing their homes robbed. Wow. 
How, how did he know these homes were going to be robbed? Well, they have these computers, of course, more computer algorithms that predict hot spots all around the city. And so they, they send officers out there and they say they drop crime about 13 percent. Well, you know, why, ha why can't they use these to go out and, and, and go after the guys on Wall Street and predict when they're going to commit crimes? Can't they use these algorithms and tweak them to see when they're going to create the next bubble or when they're going to create the next engineered crash? Can they do that? I mean, I wish they could. But no, they seem to be going after the, the petty criminal, the guy who's going to break into your house and steal your stereo or your TV or your iPod. You know, not the guy stealing billions and billions of dollars. You won't see the LAPD going after those guys. That's just not in their uh, agenda. Moving on to more police state news. DHS gives UC Berkeley armored personnel carrier. You know, because uh, UC Berkeley, they need one. And this comes, this is funny. UCPD spokesperson Lieutenant Eric Tejada justified the purchase by pointing to an event last year when a man reported to be carrying an AK-47 assault rifle, despite the fact that the incident turned out to be a false alarm. There it is. It's a false alarm. So you got this eight-ton vehicle, commonly referred to as a Bearcat, is used by U.S. troops on the battlefield, is often equipped with a rotating roof hatch, powered turrets, gun ports, a battering ram, and weapon system used to remotely engage a target with lethal force. Or in the case of UC Berkeley, a bunch of stupid hippies that are protesting whatever. That's what they're going to go after with this thing. How much did it cost? Oh, well, the city council accepted a $285,000 grant from Homeland Security to purchase one of the vehicles back in 2007. Oh, no, that was in New Hampshire. I'm sorry. That caused a, an uproar in a New Hampshire town. How much did, they, did it cost this time? Of course, it, oh, just a $200,000 grant from the Department of Homeland Security, and that's the University of California. So that's where your tax money's going. It's going into pre-crime for petty criminals and giant tanks to take down anybody who may be educated enough to realize that they're being screwed over by the system that they're paying into with their tax money. Moving on. New socialist French nanny state mandates breathalyzers in all cars. A poll released over the weekend reveals that nearly 60% of respondents have yet to install the device. Okay, because they have to get these in there. This new law goes into effect by November 1st or they face a fine of 11 euros or around $14. I've got a story for you. Back in college, I used to, uh, I, I had a friend who was a guitar player and he lived up on this hill, had a bunch of, uh, a bunch of trailers. And the guy next door to him liked to drink a lot. In fact, he liked to drink so much he got busted for DWI several times and he actually had one of those devices in his car. And you know how he got around it? He had other people who weren't drinking breathe into it for him so he could start his car. And that's how people are going to get around this. I mean, this is a stupid law. We're going to have, a, you know, another thing of the nanny state coming in. This is, of course, in France where they just invited the socialists into their lives to tell them how to live. It's coming to us very soon. Uh, moving on. Obama wants you on food stamps. And this was sent in. I love that graphic there. Liquor, discount cigarettes and beer. We accept food stamps, people. Come on in. It's from Melissa Melton, who was one of the finalists in our... Um, reporter contest, the Obama administration recently spent $3 million to convince us that we all live healthier lives if we sign up for food stamps and get our liquor, discount cigarettes, and beer um, by using them. The U.S. Department of Ag has been running the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, a SNAP, propaganda campaign for several months now, primarily aimed at Hispanics, the elderly, and the working poor, and the unemployed, which include most of Americans at this point. And uh, they're claiming that food stamps help you eat right. And there's one woman that says, I wonder how she stays so fit. What's her secret? Oh, she eats right and she uses her food stamps and stays active. It should be noted that the USDA does not station enforcement officers at the grocery store to ensure food stamp recipients' shopping carts are filled with vegetables instead of potato chips. I've got a confession to make. I was on food stamps at one point. When I was in college, I was you know, I had a little bit of help from my parents, but basically the money that I earned working was what I had to spend, you know, on beer, going out, eating, bills, whatever. That's what I had. You know, I didn't have money to buy CDs back then. And it got bad at, uh, for a while that, oh, for about six months I was on food stamps. And you know what I spent it on? I spent it on food. I didn't spend it on liquor because back in West Virginia they didn't let you 
buy liquor with it. You can only buy food, but now I guess you could buy anything, obviously. <laughs> this liquor store accepts food stamps. I see them at the gas stations. What are you going to buy nutritional at gas stations, Michelle Obama and Ellen DeGeneres, who were seen dancing up there? Oh, we're going to teach you how to eat right. You know who teaches you how to eat right? Your parents. And if your parents didn't teach you how to eat right, I don't know. It's not much help for you. Moving on. Get ready to hold your breath, people. Arpaio is set to unleash shocking Obama birth certificate revelations, but it's going to be in two weeks. I can't disclose to you what we discovered, says Mike Zullo, but it's going to be a shocking revelation at our press conference. Don't worry. It's going to be July 17th at 2.30 p.m. I can't imagine why they would do this, but this whole two weeks thing only makes me think of one thing. It'll take two weeks. Here's your pomade. Two weeks? Excuse me? Two weeks? That don't do me no good. Two weeks. Two weeks! Well, get this place a geographical oddity. Two weeks from everywhere. The I'm holding my breath. We gotta wait two weeks to hear these amazing revelations. Sheriff Joe, didn't you learn anything from Breitbart? I mean, really, Mike Zullo, didn't you learn anything from Breitbart? I mean, you guys have stepped up your security, but two weeks, come on. Put this information out now, even if it's not in perfect font or form or if it's not in a PDF, we don't care. We wanna hear it, we need to get it out there. Don't wait, please. I hope this is a ruse and you're gonna come out with it tomorrow. Please tell me you're gonna do it tomorrow, Sheriff Joe. Well, you know, we may have to wait till July 17th, but we will report on it, whatever he says, even though the mainstream media won't. World Net Daily is going to report on it. They're actually going to stream the press conference live. Uh, but don't expect the mainstream media to report on it because you got Obamacare now, and you're ready. You're ready for the next uh, thrashing the government's going to give you. Uh, now we're going to move on to a section of Planet Infowars. Actually, oh, sorry, Daily Quote. almost forgot. Brought to you by the President, Cl President Clinton's Deputy Secretary of State, as quoted in Time, July 20th, 1992. This is Strobe Talbot. In the next century, nations as we know it will become obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. National sovereignty wasn't such a great idea after all. Look at that little nerd. Telling you that national sovereignty isn't a good idea and give up all your rights for global government. And he said that in 1992, and you know now we're 12 years into the new century, and we have to buy our health care from the insurance companies because you're too stupid to figure out how to take care of yourself unless an insurance company sells you that plan. You have to be on pharmaceuticals, you have to take your vaccines, you have to drink your Florida water, and that's the only way you're going to be safe in this government. Uh, all right, now we're going to go... So Planet InfoWars piece, and this is done with Christy Hightower and Alex Jones. This was actually the first Ask Alex segment, and for some reason it got kind of lost in the cracks of all the media that we produce here. And we're going to go to it now, and then we're going to go to break. We're going to come back with Matthew Stein, a 30-minute interview. Get your pens and papers ready. Lots of tips that we throw at you fast and furious, especially, no pun intended, especially if you're out there in some of these areas that have been affected by the power outages, or if you got wild, if you live in a wildfire fire area, yeah, this could be some information that could save your property, save your life. So that's coming up. Hey, kill Granny! We'll get some, we'll get some money. And playing on the red theme, I got my tangy tangerine, beyond tangy tangerine, <laughs> infoworksteam.com. Uh, I'm not doing real product placement. They're like, hey, there's cool filters on this camera. Let's do the uh, the rogue one where everything's red but everything else black and white. And I said, well, what's red here? Okay, this. And then we've got uh, the Beyond Tangy Tangerine dun, right dun, there. Dun, 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 dun. dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I'll come around the side of the table. Awesome, awesome. All right, here we go. Thanks. And again, we're setting up some little mini studios uh, around the office as well. Now, come on in here, Lewis. Lewis is also one of the moderators. And uh, so in the future, we're going to have this a little more high-tech for you. But it's important just to turn these videos out. What's up next here? All right. So um, this is from Catherine. She says, I'm a U.S. expat living in Canada and will be crossing the border into the U.S. this summer. Should I be worried about problems at the border if I'm constantly posting your videos, things about Ron Paul, Agenda 21, Bilderbergers, Endgame? I plan to show my Canadian citizenship instead of my U.S. passport. Good idea? Bad idea? Well, you're not really a real expat. 
uh, I think in the technical sense, if you're just living somewhere else. You have to renounce your citizenship. So I don't think you've renounced your citizenship uh, if you've still got your U.S. passport. Um, number one, you haven't done anything wrong. And if they give you trouble for your political views, that means they're secret police. Generally, that type of stuff's not in the database yet, though they would like it to be. And they treat everybody like crap coming in. The TSA treats you bad. This is about training you that you're a slave. Uh, but the fact that you are scared of them retaliating against you shows that their demonization program, their, their chilling effect program to make you scared is working. So I think the answer is don't be scared of them. Be scared of not continuing to take action. But no, I don't think you're going to have a problem. Nice. Okay. Well, uh, the next question we have is from JD InfoWarrior, and uh, he says, will the banks be allowed to fail and hit rock bottom, or will the U.S. government and its crusade to save these abnon <laughs> ab I can't even say that. abominations take the only savings worth left in the American people's hand? Um, well, that is the plan. I mean, Bernanke is now talking about QE3 that we thought would come earlier this year. But he's like, oh, I really don't want to do QE3, which will further devalue the currency, but I'll do it if you really want me to. You know, maybe, you know, if banks continue to fail, you got big six mega banks that own the private Federal Reserve that are pretty much foreign owned. They are busy imploding the European economy and our economy to consolidate it. Just like banks always famously try to take the farm when there's like one payment left right. using technicalities. And so that's what's going on here. Banks, the big mega banks, not your local bank. Your local bank is actually performing a service, uh, but it's engaged in fractional reserve banking as well. For every dollar on deposit, they loan out 10. So it's all just numbers in a machine. Uh, it's fractional reserve banking or money changing. You can debate whether that system's good or not. It always ends up getting abused, probably bad. But we know it's bad when six mega banks themselves get the lion's share of government bailouts at 0% interest, then leverage it out 10 to 1, and charge you 25, 30 percent interest on it. And so these are the guys that are trying to wreck our economy so they can pose as heroes and salvage it. But by salvaging it, it's in the old sense of your shipwrecks on the coast and under old common law, that means anybody who lives there locally can cut your ship up and basically rob it. In fact, look up the uh, wreckers, wreckers in history. They would put up fake lighthouses and then have ships wreck and then, and then and loot them. But uh, that's basically what's happening there. Bottom line, uh, this globalist system of inflation helps the ultra-rich, hurts the working class and middle class. So it's another form of hidden taxation brought to you by the New World Order. Man. Um, all right, good education here. Uh, Macropode asks you, um, I'm wondering, what would you say to Obama if you had the chance to talk to him today? I would tell Obama that I know that he basically just reads off a teleprompter and that he's just a Harvard lawyer and that I understand he's a puppet. And, and, and those aren't meant as insults. I would say I understand that you were picked and selective because you're pliable, you're well-spoken, uh, and you're meant to be a front. Uh, but you're signing on to eugenics, you're signing on to totally wicked world government, and you need to understand that in the final equation you will be judged for what you're doing, if not in this life, uh, you know, in the next plane of existence. And I would challenge him if he had any humanity left uh, to not be part of this New World Order uh, system. I mean, I'd tell him like they live. I can see. And I see you. I mean, what does it mean to go to these big dinners. I, I would say to him, I, you know, I bet when you were climbing the social ladder as a, front, as a foundation front that, that you wanted to attain success and, and, and you wanted the goal. Now you're the president. Now you see that it's all just a bunch of bull. And a lot of people, when they actually do finally get power, realize, well, this is no big deal. There isn't some magic cloud nine you get to where everything gets great. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so I tell him, be like JFK actually try to do things, and even if you get killed in the process, so what? At least you've got some humanity. But somebody like Obama, I mean, they vetted him up one side and down the other. I, I, I might even hold my breath, unless it was in public. And then as a prop, because that's all Obama is, as a prop, I would say things to him to then get people out there to actually ask themselves that question. 
But I think Obama's a dead end. Well, uh, Weedtastic asks you, uh, Alex, will you protest at the Occupy Kimball Castle? Have you heard of it? It's a top 100 Illuminati banksters meeting for the Satanic Ceremony in Colorado, supposedly June 21st. You know, people once told me about Bohemian Grove like 17 years ago. I didn't believe in it. Mm -hmm. So will you look into that for yeah, me? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, I've, I think I've heard of that castle, but I don't, I don't know about that stuff. So I know the globalists have got lots of other meeting places and weirdness they engage in, not just Bilderberg. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Patrick asks, uh, Alex, I really like it when you show the lighter side of the world, such as the, its infinite beauty and the good that people do. Could you maybe dedicate a show to this idea? Or maybe do more videos of this. Uh, I think people would appreciate this and not constant doom and gloom. I have had a long-term idea, but I'm always so caught up just in all the other stuff we're doing, to really talk about the beauty of the universe. It's like an open poem to the humanity and the universe. Instead of just saying, look at the detail of the eye, or look at a beautiful planet we're on going through space, and the stars, and the sunrise and sunset, little fish in a pond swimming around. Uh, I mean, that's, that's an ode to the beauty of the planet and all that's good, but to really, just for months, mark down all the good things that are out there. Maybe we should create a group that is the beauty of the universe, where people could talk about what they think is best in the world, that, of course, the globalists wage war against eternally. I mean, it's like they're the devil. I hadn't seen it since I was a teenager, and I, I bought it, so I could watch it on the treadmill, the DVD of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, that movie uh, that... Uh, Ridley Scott put out with Tom Cruise, uh, Legend. And it's like, you know, the goblins want to kill a unicorn. You're like, oh, that's silly. But all of that's an archetype. That's what the globalists are doing with their GMO, with everything. They really do like wrecking things that are innocent and good. Look at the school system. They want to wreck innocence and sell it as if it's cool and fun and great. Uh, so, yes, we should have a group about beauty in the universe. Something to fight for. Yeah, yeah exactly. What's good? You know, it, yes, let's do that. Cool. Because I do want to start maybe even having a news segment on the radio or TV once a week where we talk about what's good in the world or people that did the right thing and talk about military that said no to vaccines or parents that said no or people that, you know, steadfastly uh, exposed a corrupt politician who ended up going to jail. Because a lot of what's good in the world is standing up against these bad people. Yeah. No, like you're not alone when you stand up. <clears throat> Um, okay, Javier says, uh, hi Alex, I wonder if you have heard of Dr. Scott McQuaid, um, if he's credible. He's the founder of the Inner Circle. No, I haven't heard of that. Okay, I'll look into that for you then. Uh, okay, um, user Rev says, Obama is passing another executive order soon. Did you look into them at all? Um, they're dated May 21st in 2012. He wants to transfer some quadrants of the ocean now under U.S. control directly to the United Nations. Signed, sealed, delivered. Yes, I saw that and a couple of days ago, and it got lost in the mix, and I should absolutely cover that tonight on the Nightly News. There you go. All right. Uh, Rev, you're going to be <laughs> you're bringing it to the news. I've got to get on that. In fact, I've got to go shoot the news right now. Right after this, will you guys go type in new executive order, yes. Obama new executive order, uh, law of the sea. I know that the UN and Bilderberg are particularly mad they can't get everything signed over to the UN as a way to tax the nation states. And they've had Trent Lott out pushing and everybody, they want Law of the Sea because that's a big taxing mechanism. They want carbon taxes, not for the environment, but to be absolutely able to dominate the globe. That's a global government. If 75% of the world is salt, about a percentage and a half is fresh, that's 76.5%, not even counting underground aquifers. They're saying the UN's going to run all our major rivers. Anything that touches a ocean or a gulf, a sea, it's a huge global power grab. Congress is announcing they want to sign over the internet to the UN. And again, the UN is just run by big mega banks. Only the Security Council has power on all those nations voting and all that does nothing. Even if you wanted other nations to be able to vote on what you were doing. The big banks could go lobby them to get them to vote the way they want because they're all so poor and the globalists have kept them that way. But here, it's the you know, G8 inside the National Security Council uh, inside the UN Security Council that totally controls it. So it was created by the Rockefellers in 45 to transfer our sovereignty into piecemeal by treaty. Big deal. Yeah. Big deal. Okay. And, 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 and I saw that he was talking about an executive order two days ago. 
to do it. But if that's the case, territorial waters, I knew they were trying to hand stuff over to Russia off Alaska. My God, is there no end to this? He's He's the president. He's passed the most executive orders of any president. And he promised not to. He promised not to hire lobbyists. Hired the most. Promised to be right. the most transparent, the most untransparent. Right. Promised to not take banker money. Took the most. I mean, it's just just propagated ideas. To well, when you saw all of Hollywood and TV get behind him and say he might be Jesus and the one and all this, I mean, come on, folks. These are the people that sell you all this crud. When the whole system gets behind somebody, look out. Uh, Constitutional World Order uh, user writes, uh, at what point do we decide that a new system needs to be installed? Will we continue to protest a system that doesn't adhere to our cries? Or do we resort to violence against the system? Or do we build a new idea that no army can stand against, an army of ideas standing together? We have to agree on what those ideas are first. Yeah. But, but I mean, just the term being used here, Constitutional World Order. That's the username. No, I like that idea, but, but cool. even before I heard what they had to say, just the idea of constitutional world order, people like Lord Monckton, I'll show you a shot of this right here. People like Lord Monckton, they, you know, they say, we've got to have a world system against the you know, UN dictatorial world government. And that it would be alliances of nations who agree with each other's ideas forming a global federation. The problem with that is, is that different subgroups will get together, you'll have intrigue, and you'll end up unifying this just like this is unified. That's the big danger in, in anything like this. And inside a planetary system, if there are still sovereign nations, if you get a Hitler, and he takes over this country and takes over this country and gets to this country. Then in an emergency, and that's what the globalists did, they got us a, a, a League of Nations and then a UN out of world wars. They started. These documents have been declassified and released. We've been covering this. They actually, the whole time, England, the U.S., and others were funding Hitler in World War I before that getting the war started so that this big guy would rise. He didn't work for him. They just helped get him in place and profiled him and encouraged him that there was going to be a treaty with England that had been signed that the deputy Fuhrer tried to deliver and then got arrested and that you know there were deals with the US and all this stuff Hitler had almost done a coup here working with the Bushes uh, Prescott Bush but I mean that, that gets more in a complex history so to get nations into this world government they created a false dichotomy between a block over here that would attack this block, then this block dominates them, then Bilderberg is created and you merge these two blocks. You understand how that works? And that's how their Hegelian dialectic and the synthesis worked, is through this program. And so that's why today, and they talk about this in the latest Bilderberg documents we got from 66, they need other threats to keep the world, so they have Al-Qaeda, Al-C-I-A, duh. <laughs> You, know, you have the West over here. Oh my gosh, Al Qaeda. Oh, Russia. Russia's going to get us right here. Oh, China. Meanwhile, the globalists are funding all these groups too. And again, the real thing is they're unifying the planet with a global corporate government against not very good, but <laughs> against this. You understand? It's full spectrum dominance. They'll play all the different parts off against each other because they're going after the whole. You're like, well, does it make sense? Why are they funding Al Qaeda if they're fighting them? They have to have Al Qaeda in an area if they're going to have an excuse to come take it over. Or if they're going to have an excuse to have the TSA come after you within the homeland. Get drug over the United States. Anyways, there it is. All right, so I hope that answers that question. What was his original question? Uh, I don't remember now. <laughs> At what point do you decide that this new system needs to be taken down and a new one needs to be put up? So. Well, people, I'm not saying he's saying that, but or she's saying that, but people confuse our constitutional republic is not working, so we need something new. No, we had a revolution by the globalists against our constitutional republic. We're now living in lawless globalism where these special interests do whatever they want. So we want to restore the Bill of Rights and Constitution, which they hate so much because it's so effective against them. That's the answer. Okay, what else is going on here? Um, uh, Sin 
Uyghur from the Young Turks has on record spoke out against the bill Obama signed to detain Americans. Is he finally waking up or pulling a Glenn Beck trick? I forget how you really pronounce his name. You pronounce it wrong. I can't pronounce okay. it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like sink Uyghur or something. I, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, that guy works over there with Al Gore. Al Gore's always wanted tyranny. I, I really think he's naive. I mean, he, he, he left MSNBC because he wouldn't be under their control. So I, I don't think he's a terrible guy, but he doesn't understand he'd have a bigger audience not even being on current TV. I'm sure he gets paid money or something. I mean, he has no audience. See, that's why they want to censor the Internet now. Yeah. Because Scary. MSNBC has almost no audience. I mean, my little show is bigger than them. Just in Alexa or Google Analytics. Just my radio show is much bigger than MSNBC. Uh, I mean, I mean, they're, the truth, I mean, their whole network in mind, yeah, but they probably make 50 times the money we do, which is not even our goal, but if we had that money, we could be a lot bigger and effectively challenge them. That's why they know now that they're in trouble, so they're trying to come in with internet censorship and the rest of them. And I don't want to just sit here and say bad things about the Young Turk guy. It's just that, you know, one time I said in a video, I'm bigger than the Young Turks. And he took one YouTube channel and said, no, I'm bigger than you. And he didn't take all of our channels, and he didn't take our web ratings on Alexa. He didn't take XM, the satellites, all that stuff. Where's where's really, uh, you know, well, if you go to Google Analytics, I don't, I don't have it here in front of me, but I'm going to pull the actual data in my mind. I mean, here's here's Young Turks, and here's, I mean, here's InfoWars. I mean, our total traffic on Google's like this. They're just flatlined down here. They're not even, I mean, it's not even a debate. And then he made a big joke out of it, like I was going, hey, I'm bigger and better than you. No, that's not what it was even about. I was talking about how there's mainstream media that now, just like Time or, or uh, Newsweek has um, the Daily Beast, they're trying to act like they're alternative now. And so I'm saying that's what the Young Turks are, is they're just the system trying to take something that is alternative media, they were alternative media, and bringing it in but trying to control it. Manipulate. Yeah. Exactly. So I was pointing out that this is the establishment trying to take on alternative media colorations. Even though you come from a leftist perspective, you were alternative media. And I was saying, you figured that out, so you left MSNBC, but you jumped right back in to Al Gore trying to talk like th the alternative. And again, it's not like I have all the answers either. In fact, I don't even, it's one of their questions. I shouldn't even have got off into it. But uh, anyways. Um, and the last question brought to you by Rembrandt10. Uh, hi, Alex. I'm 23, <clears throat> living in Ontario, Canada, and I have no job, and I'm feeling vulnerable to the new world order tactics. My question is, is it safe to be taking materials that address themselves, um, being about Catholicism, Freemasonry, from my public library? Driving down the road is not safe. Everything kills you. What's not safe is that people think they're being watched. And that's why the system has said, yeah, we're, we're watching what you check out. Yeah, we go to Borders and Barnes and Nobles, the government says, and get a list of what you're buying. That's why they always want your info, even if you're paying cash. So we're in that tyranny. I thought all this data mining before it was ubiquitous, before it was in place across the board, because I knew it was criminal and a sign of tyranny. But now that it's all in place and the CIA director says they're watching us and listening to us without warrants, don't let it intimidate you. Let it be information you use to expose the fact that they're lawless and criminal. It's that simple. So don't let these people intimidate you. Uh, but yeah, now, if you're getting things out of there about Catholicism or about Freemasonry, um, more and more they want the system digitized so they know what you're reading. But that doesn't mean you need to be scared. All of us need to be reading and researching, and you can try to arrest us all. If we ever get to that point, which we're starting to get to, where people are like, oh my God, I better not visit this website, like InfoWars.com, I better not go to the library, they've already won. The answer to this 1984 system is 1776. And what does that mean? You, if you're scared, you should be out there doing street art to expose these people. You should be starting your own radio show online, your own YouTube videos. The fact that you're afraid, you should go out and protest because you should be afraid. You should be afraid of not challenging these crooks because if they do fully get into power, it's over. Okay, It's that simple. 
And wow, 11 questions. I'm going to go shoot the nightly news if you guys can find me that particular executive order. I heard he was talking about it. I didn't know. I guess he's already done it. Or, or maybe these haven't been released yet. Um, but try to find out. I can mention that at the end of the nightly news tonight and uh, cover that on the radio tomorrow. But this is really good. Uh, PlanetInfoWars.com. And at least every week, uh, we'll take uh, 10 or 11 questions and uh, we will answer them here for you. And I think it's also important that after you've uploaded this at PlanetInfoWars.com, make sure we start giving this to Aaron or Jacobson or somebody else. We need to start posting these on the YouTube channel too. Cool, absolutely. And they can put a Planet InfoWars bug on there. So folks watching out there want to ask me questions, go get a free uh, membership, membership uh, create your own group, create your own profile, PlanetInfoWars.com. Thanks a lot, guys. Sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at InfoWars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure, but if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. Welcome back to InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. And like we covered earlier um, in the show, we have a lot of natural disasters going on. We've got fires out in Colorado. We've got major storms. They're calling them land hurricanes going out in the, in the uh, eastern area, hitting D.C., Maryland. Uh, and then we have Fukushima that's looming out there over in the Pacific that's just slowly sending radiation our way. Well, what do we do? Well, Today I called Matt Stein and said, Matt, what's going on? What can, what can people do? What kind of tips can we give people out there? Things they could do now to help themselves when these things happen. And uh, so he's agreed to come on. Matthew Stein has a BS from MIT and is a best-selling author of When Disaster Strikes, which we carry at Infowars.com, a comprehensive guide for emergency planning and crisis survival. We also carry When Technology Fails, his other book, which is a little bit bigger than when disaster strikes. I'm sure it's chocked full with all kinds of stuff. Uh, when writing, and there's, there's uh, when technology fails, and that is a manual for self-reliance, sustainability, and surviving the long emergency, stuff we've been talking about here for a long time. Uh, when writing when disaster strikes, Stein spent months researching EMP, solar storms, nuclear issues, and including many hours of interviews with top scientists and experts who have urged Stein to take these startling conclusions to the public's attention. It can happen at any time, and as the people of D.C. know, it's happening to them right now. So we turn now to Matthew Stein. Sir, how's it going today? Oh, it's, it's actually going quite nice in my part of the country right now. Excellent. So, well, what part of the country are you in? Your Pacific well, I live, time. I live uh, near Lake Tahoe on the border of California, Nevada, in the High Sierra Mountains. So oh, it's, beautiful. Summers in Tahoe are, are, are about as good as it gets unless the fires start blowing through, and then it gets really nasty. And so far, we're avoiding them uh, this year. Not right. on wood. Well, well let's, let's go right into fires, because we've had most of Colorado is on fire at this point. They put out about half of these that are going on. And earlier, we were talking about things that people can do just to, you know, help fireproof, not fireproof their home, but prevent some of the damage. As you mentioned, sometimes there'll be a house that's totally burnt to the ground, and right next to them, that house wasn't burnt. So what were those people doing that, that you could share with the rest of us? Okay. Well, the very first thing that most people are aware of is what's called defensible space, and that's making sure that you get anything with fuel that might bring a fire into your house as far away from your house as possible. So get rid of the tall grass, brush, uh, trim, you know, limb the trees up like 20, 30 feet up the trees if you're in a fire zone. Uh, then the things you can do is is kind of notch it up. Like there was a big fire in Laguna Beach in 1993 in Southern California, and the firestorm was really severe there, much like what you're seeing in Colorado. And in that situation, 
the average home, whether you've got defensible space or not, is going to is going to incinerate. And but there were a few homes that were so fire resistant that the firestorm went right over the top of them and around them and didn't burn them up. And and so you can you can kind of do sort of start at the bottom and work up in your own home and and to make them super fire resistant to survive a major firestorm that's tough but you can you can take it up in grades and improve your chances of surviving so one of the first things you can do like say there's a fire that's actually you know coming or you're you're really worried that it's severe fire danger so one of the things you can do is is take like double thick sheets of sheetrock you know cut them up and make blocks for the air vents underneath your basement and in your attic. And what that does is that when you get a, a firestorm blowing through, you have hot air will get sucked in with a chimney effect and it'll, and it'll suck embers and super hot air into your home through these vents and start your home on fire. So if you block the vents, it prevents, it keeps the air inside your home cool and prevents the super hot air from coming in from the firestorm. Now that's one level. Next level is, say you've got a firestorm coming and you've got drapes in your home. Well, it turns out that heat will radiate through from the firestorm, right through the glass, especially if it's single pane and not double pane glass. So more resistant houses have double pane glass and are well insulated, because they, and that slows the heat from coming in. So if you've got a bunch of drapes hanging by your windows and you know that it, you've got to evacuate and you want maybe to come back to a home instead of a, a burned out cinder shell, then rip those grapes down or, you know, pull them down, get them away from the windows, anything that might get ignited from heat radiating through the windows. And obviously, if you can hose things down and get them wet, that's good. And especially up on your roof, if you've got an old shake roof, if you think ahead of time, there's stuff called fire stop, various different versions that you can spray on the wood roof, spray on your wood decks, and it won't stop a super hot firestorm that, you know, that'll burn any kind of wood. But it will prevent a, a fire from igniting from falling embers and burnt, you know, blowing onto your deck or getting onto your wood shake roof if they're coated with the right stuff. It will prevent those things from starting it. So there's various levels. And in my book, in the fire chapter, I've got a full list of all of the things. Now, all the way at the top end of the scale, the few buildings that survived the, the super hot firestorm in Laguna Beach were all stucco or earth-based, adobe kind of based buildings. And they put stucco or cement board, like hardy board that looks like wood, but it's, it's, it's concrete wood, but looks like wood, underneath the eaves. And they put a layer of stucco or cement board underneath the decks. And you can put a fiberglass called, you know, polymer coat that I give the specific name for in the book, don't remember off the top of my head, that's very fire resistant on top of the decks. Or nowadays, if you're building a new deck, you build it out of Class A fire-resistant materials uh, that will stop, that won't burn, that are really, really good. They're a polymer with uh, fly ash in them by um, a, a deck company. I've forgotten the name of that, too, off, off the top of my head. So those are some different things you can do. But what you really need to be worried about, like if a fire storm is coming, you got to use judgment because it's much better to be cautious and leave than not. And if you got a minute, I'll give you the story of my friends in Australia in the Black Saturday fire. I mean, that was, they, they looked out their house on a, on a Saturday morning in um, 2008, I believe, 2009, and it was 117 degrees outside. Now, that's blistering hot. And there was an extreme fire danger, but there was no warnings. And they just looked outside and they saw a big column of smoke. So they threw their computers, some critical files, a couple of bicycles, and a few clothes into their car, and they left. Now, this home was, a, was a, uh, an adobe home with a metal roof that many people would consider to be very fire resistant. And they might say, well, I'm going to stay and fight it out because I've got this really, like, really fire resistant home. Well, these people got in their car because they knew they had a forest around them. And that if there was a severe firestorm coming through, that, you know, their home may not survive, even though it was adobe with a metal roof. So they went to some friend's home that had a more defendable space that had, that was no, no forest around them, just tall grass. And they had a pond and they had fire pumps and they had a bulldozer and they had all those kinds of things. And they fought the fire at their friend's home and it was pretty severe. They had a 10 foot, 15 foot tall 
wall of fire coming up, but with their equipment and just being grass, they were able to hold it at bay. But when they came back to their home, they found that all of the bicycle tool repair shop tools were molten, and the home was totally gone, and there was only three adobe walls left standing, and outside of that, there wasn't a shred left of their home. So this is where you got to use smarts, because 173 people died, and in, in, entire towns were incinerated around theirs in that tragic day. And there was entire families found incinerated in their cars when they were trapped trying to escape. So you really got to use good sense and good judgment in a situation like this. Well, and especially when you have valleys and uh, ridges, and if you're on a ridge line, the fire's below you, that's the worst place to be because that fire is coming up at you, and it'll come up at oh, you quick. It really fast. And, you know, fires, we had 60-mile-an-hour winds in the fires in, in Colorado recently, and we had a firestorm near our house with high winds uh, back oh, about 12, 15 years ago started about a mile and a half downwind and luckily the wind stayed the dominant direction and blew it away from us but there was no stopping it it closed the freeway two or three times uh, there was absolutely no way of stopping that firestorm anything in front of it you know they'd saved a few buildings and some others went and luckily mostly it went up a mountainside and they were able to stop at the top of the mountain before it went down and burned out reno but it was it was severe and it lasted for i don't know two two weeks before it burned itself out on the ridge and uh, they kept it from blowing over the ridgetop down to Reno. So, yeah, you, you, it can go faster than you can drive in these firestorms. And uh, a very serious, very scary situation if you've ever been near one. Well, you know, you talked about getting out and, you know, they threw some bikes, they threw their computers in. And, and you mentioned that in a press release you sent out today uh, of the things you should grab when you're going to get going. Uh, when you have to make that time, I, I, you called it, let me see, let me grab this here. Um, evacuate their home. My life in a box. I like how you title it that way. Your life in a box, these are the things you need to have, you know, if nothing else, you're going to grab that in your grab and go bag. You know, well, right. what, what should people right. put inside their life in a box? Okay, my life in a box has your critical documents to put your life back together in case you really lose everything. So you've got copies, maybe alien cards, birth certificates, um, you have the you know, stock certificates, you have all of your insurance documents. Think of all of those important things where you'd say, man, I am really in trouble if I lost all of those. And in fact, it's a good idea to make copies of those and send them to someone in like a far off place of the country. And some people put them in safety deposit box copies. And that's a good idea too. But think about where you live. If you're in an area where maybe you and your bank would get burned in the same thing or fall down in the same earthquake or the same hurricane might take you down, it's a really good idea to get them off-site and also to have them ready so you can just pick up that box and go. Now, these aren't things like food, water, shelter. These are items that help you put your life back together or get things going again because, you know, it, Realize if you got a local bank, maybe the bank's burned out too or gone in that earthquake or, or, you know, there's been an EMP or something even larger than that. And having hard copies on hand could make the difference between your information totally gone and being able to retrieve it. Right. And then let's talk earlier, I saw you, you had your uh, backpack with the, uh, it was like your grab and go bag and you also had the blue yeah. tote. Let's, uh, why don't you pick that up and show it to everybody okay. and also okay. describe the things that need to go in that. So here's the blue tote. And uh, and then here's my go bag. So with the go bag, see, I live in earthquake and wildfire country. Yeah. And uh, so if this time of year an earthquake happened out here where I am, what happens? Well, earthquake busts water lines. It busts the gas lines. Um, you know, water heaters and things fall over and fires break out. And now all of a sudden I've got bridges are down and there's a firestorm blowing my way if it starts up wind from me it's going to come my way and nobody's going to be able to fight it because they can't get over the bridges and you know it'll be so widespread so i have to be plan on the possibility of evacuating on foot with my bag or you know preferably i go in my four-wheel drive truck and i pick up my trailer and everything's great and i've got my little home on wheels with a solar panel and all that i just can't necessarily count on that happening. So some of the items I have, like one of my more, most important items is water, you know, because you can live 
Most of us can get by for three weeks to a month without food. You may not like it. You will, certainly wouldn't feel good and you wouldn't be happy about it, but you could do it. But in hot weather like we're in right now, if you have to be physically active, like physically evacuate, you could be in trouble and could start dying in a single day. And certainly in three days, people start to die without water if they have to be physically active in warm weather. So I have, you know, let's face it, if you're on your own, you, you can only carry so much water in your back. And so you're going to be drinking out of the duck ponds and the local ditches and the local creeks if that's all you got. So this is... This is a backcountry water filter, kind of like a backcountry standard by uh, Mountain Safety Research, MSR. And it's field serviceable, and people take them to Nepal and Tibet and India and the third world all over. And basically, you can take this tip and stick it into your local ditch, and it's got a pre-filter on the tip. And then inside this, there's a carbon cartridge with a ceramic outside that's field serviceable. So if it plugs up, you can scrub it with a little pot scrubber and it'll take the outer layer off and you're back in business again. So I like things that are field serviceable that you can maintain you know, outside and get them going again. If they break, they're really simple to take apart with no tools, all that. So Katadyne makes a great one. Uh, MSR makes a great one. People like the Berkey filters. There's a lot of high quality filters on there. I like to go with the backcountry standards. Right, and we yeah. actually, uh, we carry a, a ProPure that I have at my house, and um, just for these, it's, it's, uh, it's lightweight, you could collapse it together, you can, it doesn't take electricity, which is the great thing, that's what I right. love about it, you right. just pour water in and you wait for it to come out, and it's good room temperature, and we keep it uh, at my house, and my kids drink out of it all the time, but it's ready to go in case we have to, to get out, it's, you know, we grab it and we go, and right. You know, that's, that's one, one of the things people need to do. I also wanted to add um, another thing. If you have a fire coming, you want to cut off the gas to your house. That's probably one of the most important things you could do because if, if you have fires or earthquakes, you're going to have those things break. And then that's the quickest way for your house to go up. I remember seeing oh, yeah. that in San Francisco. You know, why is that house burning? Well, they must have not shut off their gas. And then you see a giant flame shooting up where their gas main was. And that just you is, got it. you're asking you got for it. it. For it to come out there. Well, let's go. Uh, let's move on to um, keeping cool in this heat. We've got a lot of heat now. Your electricity goes out. Say you're in a storm in D.C. You're an old person. How are you going to keep cool when it's hot outside? Well, we'll go on to that in just a second. I just okay. want to mention one of the reasons I have the blue tub and the backpack uh -huh. is is that there's certain items where I've got like big fat items that I want to bring right. and skinny. Like this is my first aid kit when it's on my back mm -hmm. and this is my first aid kit when it's in my blue tub so just think about that so gotcha. you know that's why you have them both not just one okay now keeping cool when it's hot I mean the obvious thing is evaporative cooling if you can do fans if you get yourself wet uh, those hats that have the gel packs in them are really good or the things around the neck but in the old-fashioned washcloth and a water bottle or a tub of water you just get it wet Keep your neck and your head wet to keep your brains cool. Extremely important. The ways to recognize when somebody's in trouble with heat, there's two things that are, that are very serious. Heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Now, heat exhaustion is not as serious. When you're kind of hot and sweaty and pale and, and a little clammy in the skin and you feel terrible, maybe nauseous, a headache, that's not life-threatening, but it's serious. You've got to keep that body cool. Lots of towels, fans, keep that cool. Now, if you pass that point, now typically in heat exhaustion, you might have dilated pupils. Now, when you pass in a heat stroke, it's life-threatening. And you've got to change the, you've got to take the body temperature down right away. So this is important. If you see somebody who's gotten like beet red in the face, their skin is dry, you know, they should be sweating, but their skin is dry. That means their body is shutting down and it's not sweating and cooling itself properly anymore. The pupils are tiny. In this, it's life-threatening. You've got to get that temperature down. Ice baths, cold baths, wet, and the fans. Now, if someone's super hot and it's very hot outside and you can't get them wet and you put a fan on them, it'll actually make it worse because it'll be driving like 100 plus heat on them and make their body even hotter and their body's not cooling. You need moisture for a fan to work. So if you're not, you've got to either have body sweat or make it artificially wet with towels and ice cubes to keep yourself cool. Any, any more questions on those lines? No, that, sound, that sounds good. I mean, those are common sense things, but it might not be stuff you're thinking about 
in the thick of it. You know, you got, you know, the power goes out. You got a tree falling through your house. Uh, you know, the next day you wake up. Well, now it's 110 degrees. You right. got to keep cool somehow. Uh, and if you don't have a generator with an air conditioner, you're going to be out of luck, essentially. Now, a small generator will keep your food from rotting, mm -hmm. and it'll allow you to, you know, run some small things in your house, like those portable Honda ones. Right. They're great. They're quiet. They'll run all day, but they won't be big enough to power your AC. you got to have two of the small generators that they can synchronize together to do your AC, or like a job site generator. And they're more expensive, and they're loud and obnoxious when you go up to the larger generators, but they will keep your AC running, but, you know, they'll, they'll drive your your neighbor's crazy with the noise and they'll drive you crazy with the noise, but better than passing out in the heat. Yeah, that, uh, I remember when uh, Hurricane Rita hit, hit my parents' house really bad and there was no power. Oh, it had to be for at least six or seven days. I drove yeah. down from Austin to go help them out. Um, you know, the army had gone through and, and cleared the brush, but they just piled it in everybody's yards. And what, but they did, they did do a good job of clearing out the brush. I will admit that, but we had, a giant generator keeping one room cool at night. And that was our one room. <laughs> and the rest of the time, you know, we were sitting around hosing ourselves down. We had, we did have a little bit of water that we could go get. And, uh, and they also had a swimming pool in the back, which we were able to use that water from and pull it out. And it wasn't, you know, it had a tree in it, but it wasn't that bad. You know, you could use right. it for washing clothes or, or just hosing stuff down, cleaning stuff off. But yeah, you know, we didn't drink it because we had plenty of bottled water. It, it wasn't, as bad, but I really feel bad for these people in D.C. who are probably not used to living in the lap right. of luxury without uh, without electricity. So it's not good. Without A.C. Yeah. Now, one thing, other thing you can do to keep some of your food from spoiling, if you have no generator and you have, you know, you have no power, you have no generator to keep your refrigerator going, you can, what they, the old style refrigerators in the summer, would take burlap bags and they'd you know punch like a little little tiny hole in a bottle upside down it's chicken feeder principle so it would kind of dribble onto the bag and let water into it slowly to keep it moist and that will keep your stuff you know if 10 20 30 degrees cooler depending on how how dry the air is and how hot it is outside than the ambient so you it won't keep it cold like a refrigerator but it'll help it to spoil less quickly does, does that make sense and um, you know it's better than nothing but it, it certainly your food will still rot without a refrigerator after a little while and that's where having stored food that doesn't require refrigeration is so important to have right. that on hand yeah and and at, at Infowars we actually have a 72 hour grab and go bag which does have the things you need to cook it to you know obviously you're going to need to add water but in a bag that you could grab you never know when that emergency is going to strike, and that's the thing. It's better to be prepared and not need it than need it and not have it. Sure, it's like car insurance. Nobody goes down the road saying, I want to get in a head-on collision today because I got insurance. It's like, no, you know, you hope you never need to use the insurance, and nobody's upset when they don't get to use that insurance, and it's the same way with your prep stuff is, you know, don't be upset. Be happy if you don't ever have to use it, but I think in our modern world, chances are, Pretty much everybody who preps is going to have to use it one of these days, and everybody who doesn't prep is going to be really sorry one of these days. That's true. And uh, one thing I like to add to your car insurance analogy: you can't eat your car insurance. <laughs> no, that's true. You, if you lose your job, you can't eat your car insurance, but you can eat your your emergency prep food. That is totally correct. There that's you that. go. Um, yeah. So, g going back to, have you been keeping um, up to date with what's going on in Fukushima? I have been watching it. I haven't watched it much recently, but I do know that uh, there's roughly 50 Chernobyl's worth of fuel in the spent fuel ponds, mm -hmm. and in, it's about a it's about a three-year engineering project to develop the robots to begin to dismantle the spent fuel ponds because they don't have robots that can handle that level of radiation to go in there right now. And it, they're talking 10 years between the development project followed by dismantling the ponds to dismantle those ponds. So you're looking at 10 Chernobyls, 5 to 10 Chernobyls worth of stuff hanging out on these blown out buildings that uh, chances that they're going to be around before they've, by the time they've managed to dismantle them are slim. So my guess is that you're going to see 
a, a really extreme crisis one of these days when at least one of the spent fuel ponds fails, whether it fails due to corrosion and blowing out from the radiation, or whether it fails due to uh, due to the next you know decent sized earthquake that happens in the vicinity, I don't know. But I, I would doubt that they're going to last the full 10 years before they've developed the, the project has gone to completion to dismantle them and safely take that debris somewhere else. So it's pretty serious. And, uh, and you know, slowly we're putting in radiation significant amounts into the, into the environment now. But when those fuel ponds fail, you're going to see an escalated crisis. And some people say, well, that's the time to move to the southern hemisphere. But I honestly think that they'll have no choice but to do like what they did with the Chernobyl 200 where they sacrifice a bunch of lives and people give their lives for Japan and they encase them in concrete and dirt and steel. But, um, you know, you'll never know until it happens uh, how that plays out. Well, and they obviously weren't prepared for that situation. They were storing the spent fuel rods on top of the reactor, which was, I, I can't even imagine why they were doing that. We but do that, it, too. You know, uh, we do that, too, exactly. Yeah. And, and we do that, too, because we never came <laughs> with a plan to dispose of it properly. And, and we let these fake-funded uh, leftists, you know, say, we don't want the fuel rods over here. We don't want them in this mountain. Well, they got to go somewhere, period. Or you, you stop doing nuclear power, you know. And, and yeah. I, don't, I don't ever see them clamoring about that. I always see them talking about coal power, never about nuclear power. Uh, a couple uh, People clamor about getting rid of nuclear power. It's just that uh, it's been, you know, everything was – really great until Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, and then it was like, okay, now we fixed it, and then nothing else happened, and then Fukushima happened. So I think people's uh, faith that, that those engineers are going to figure out a permanent long-term solution are pretty slim. And in Finland, they have a – it's like From Here to Eternity or something is the name of the movie, but they have an amazing clip of a three-generation-long building project. In other words, the guy working on it today – his parents' generation started the project, and his kids' generation will finish the project, and it's to provide a permanent repository that will last 100,000 years, because that's how long this stuff is deadly for. Yeah. And so, I mean, imagine building a structure to last 100,000 years. I mean, the the pyramids, the Great Pyramid is, 3, 000, is, is like, what, 4,000 years old, 4,500 years old? And this right. is a 100,000 year project to store this stuff. So I think that anyone who says it's a long-term solution is, just, is like got their head up, you know where. And and we, we there are other solutions. I'm talking. There's there's real cold fusion coming online. Mm -hmm. There's real demonstrations. There's a variety of alternatives as well as renewables. So if we would just put the kind of money into developing those that we put into developing the current fossil fuels and nuclear, then we could get off of this crazy path and stop killing the planet and stop uh, poisoning the world for generations to come. You right. know, only well, a leftist, whatever. And another, well, another word on that, I think when they came out with nuclear power, they were looking at two different types. There was a Thorazine-based, I believe that's the type, and there's the type we use, which creates lots of DU that they get to put into the weapons. So I think Right. Uh, military brass prevailed on that, and, and we got our, our endless supply of DU to pollute the rest of the world in addition to create a nuclear power solution that isn't viable and, and is disgusting and, and leaves us with a lot of crap that we don't know what to do with. Essentially, yeah, we don't know what to do with it. Yeah, there is thorium, and apparently... Thorium, that's what it was. Yeah, the, uh, the first reactor at Indian Point, north of New York City, was started out as thorium. Mm-hmm. And it had its own sets of problems. Now, it didn't have the problem of, you know, extreme. It, ha it has a more plentiful source of, of fuel by a long shot, and not nearly as deadly, and not ne and it doesn't produce any weapons grade material. So those, the no weapons grade material is one reason why it was axed. But apparently, it's got a significant set of problems also, and it's not all perfect like the thorium advocates tell you. Right. But the the cold fusion stuff or it's maybe it's transmutation maybe it's cold fusion something is going on there there's a number of demo units out now that are showing on a small scale and there's some large people who are trying to build up you know on andrea rossi in italy and mm -hmm. decathlon in greece so there's there's a lot of projects and i think it's just a matter of a few years before somebody's got a very scalable technology that kind of takes off and takes over the world energy thing so it's like we but if you're one of those guys, and I know two of them, they're having a hell of a time getting funding for it. Yeah. And who wants to like, fund their own demise? You know, these yeah. guys who could fund this stuff are the ones who are invested in the system now. 
That's right. It, the part of the problem is the one percent that both in the corporations and in the people that got to the top got there by the old system that's taken the planet down. So mm -hmm. the question then becomes, how do the one percent finally realize it's in their own best interest to to slit their throats in one sense and go this new direction? So it's it's pretty tough. It's it's like it'll be very entertaining to see how this uh, how this drama plays out. Do we? Do we destroy planet Earth or do we save it? Or is it somewhere in between? Or do we get ourselves knocked really, really, really badly yeah. and then finally empower the people in the power to make the major changes to prevent collapsing the world as we know it? And most of the people I talk to, I call them the optimistic doomers, seem to be in that category. Actually, in the last year, it's flipped. It used to be two out of three were optimistic doomers. One out of three thought we were over the tipping point and we were going to crash the system no matter what. The last year or two, it's kind of flipped. Now it's like two out of three say we're past the tipping point and, and we're going to crash no matter what. And that includes people on the left, right, and center. That's oh, not sure. just lefties. That's like all the, the full spectrum of America seems to be feeling that way now, at least the ones I talk to. And, and so uh, it, it's, it's interesting times we live in. And if, and if you don't have your grab-and-go kit ready and you don't have at least some basics, then um, shame on you. Well, and I would recommend a couple things for that. We have these, uh, they're, they're little cards. They're called uh, rad stickers. And they basically oh, yeah. point out, you know, if you're in, a, in an area with radiation, you know, you wear these on your body. We'll get a shot of that here overhead. And we also have Thyrosafe, which is potassium iodide tablets. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about potassium iodide. It's not something you want to start taking now. It's something you only want to start taking if you know you have radiation coming at you. What, what can you tell us about potassium iodide? Well, potassium iodide is actually you carry something else that's a broader band thing than the potassium iodide. Uh, you are also stocking motophilin on yep. your store now. There it is. And, I was just about to bring that up. And the potassium iodide basically, see when around Chernobyl, the Chernobyl necklace is like everywhere. And that's thyroid tumors. Mm -hmm. And in the Pacific Islanders who are downwind from the Bikini Atoll and the U.S. You know, open air tests, and to, to a lesser degree, the people in Utah, you know, downwind from the Nevada test site, uh, it's like they, did, they never blew it off when it was headed towards lots of people like Vegas. They only blew it off when it headed out in the, you know, those, those poor people in the smaller towns out there in, in southern Utah. And, and so the Chernobyl necklace is when the radioactive heavy metals go into the body in the iodine, and it, the iodine gets, is used by the thyroid gland, and then it lodges in there, and, and it leads to tumors and cancers over time. So when you take potassium iodide, you're saturating your body with non-radioactive iodine so that the body doesn't tend to suck in the iodine. But it's not really getting rid of the poison that much out of your body. It's it's preventing the iod it's giving you enough iodine so you're not sucking in the iodine. But it's not preventing you from getting like the strontiums and the cesiums in the body and the uraniums and the plutoniums. But it is protecting you from radioactive iodine to a large degree. Now the other material you've got, the motophilin, that's a a kelp extract where they've made it very bioavailable. See if you and I go out and eat kelp, well we're not. You know, we're not uh, ocean-going animals, so our body's not designed to digest kelp. But when it's processed properly, then you get all of this bioactive iodine, and you have other active ingredients in the kelp that help to bond to the radioactive heavy metals in your body and actually help the body dump it. It's called chelation, and it bonds to the metals, and it dumps it out through your urine and through your feces. So the motophilin is actually gives you much broader protection than the the, iod the uh, potassium iodide does. And, and it helps you protect you against all of the metals. Now, nothing's perfect. You know, I mean, obviously perfect is like not ingesting any radioactive material yourself, either breathing it in or coming in through your food or water. That's perfect. But, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. So I'm taking four capsules of the uh, motophilin every day, and I will as long as I live provided mm -hmm. I have access to it. Well it says here 40 pounds of raw seaweed is needed to make one pound of modophyllin. So I mean it really is, they really are you know processing that to get it as concentrated as possible and there's some guys here that are taking it and they actually told me before I, I came on the air they said our, our hair and fingernails are growing a lot faster than than they did before. That's one thing they well, notice. 
Well, maybe so, maybe I should take more of this yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, what do you think? <laughs> well, they had hair to begin with, though. So. <laughs> yeah, it's it's got a lot of bioactive compounds in there, trace metals and I mean trace minerals and elements from the from the kelp and seaweed. So it's good for you whether it's doing you know in in spite of the other things, it's just good as a supplement to take. And there are people who claim it helps them to dump weight and all of that. I haven't really noticed that effect myself, but I do feel good on it and don't notice any uh, any unpleasant side effects from taking it. Right. Well, hey, let me ask you this, Matt. We have we have when disaster strikes and when technology fails. If you can only afford one, what what in your opinion is the best one to get? You know, if you're worried about this is sort of a, I got to answer with a caveat. Uh -huh. If you're worried about the world totally falling apart, then unquestionably get the bigger book when technology fails. If uh, but the new book when if you're worried if you want to be have a compact manual for your go bag that's a that's a perfect prepping and survival handbook then when disaster strikes is like your perfect prepping and survival handbook but it doesn't have the primitive technologies how to do things the old way in case everything fell apart so there's a little different focus plus when disaster strikes has new material on nuclear surviving a nuclear catastrophe on solar storms and emp specific chapters on fires a chapter on earthquakes chapter on hurricanes and floods so those very so it's got it's got some information that's not in when technology fails. So I hope I answered your question. It's it's not there's no easy way to answer it. Two two is better than one is what essentially you said. And then we also have um, strategic relocation by Joel Skousen, who we've had on the show and we we did a really in depth interview that we're putting together a DVD with his, which basically describes you know if if you're going to go with that mindset that it's all going to collapse you know, go with this at least to prepare yourself. And I think, you know, strategic relocations with when technology fails is, you know, your best bet if you're going to go in at it with a group of people and you're going to try to make it, you know, make it out of whatever happens. That's your best sure. bet. And yeah. don't forget Carla Emery's Encyclopedia of Country Living. If you want to really, you know, deal with a full-on collapse situation, then, you know, if I had like two books, only two I'd carry, I'd bring that. Mm -hmm. When... Carla Emery and When Technology Fails. If I wanted to add another book, I'd add an herbal, illustrated herbal guide with full season uh, pictures mm -hmm. to local herbs. And, and then Joel Skosen's book's a good book. You know, there's there's a lot to keep adding. So you kind of start with the core of your food, your shelter, your basic technologies, and, and your medicine and, and first aid, and then expand outward to uh, improve your library. Well, and it's our duty to be prepared. So when the time comes, the people that are prepared are going to have to share their knowledge with the people who aren't prepared. And guess what? Those people are going to be your best <laughs> friends. And they'll That's probably correct. do a lot of the legwork that need, you know, if, if you've got all the answers to stuff, these are the people that are going to help you. So, and, and that's how you build community too, with leaders and with people working together to make stuff, you know, happen. So we, you know, we can get through whatever's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. It'll probably right. be a financial crisis before anything else. Probably, but so. you know, if we have a major solar storm, the end of the end of the year, we got a solar maximum coming up. If we had a big solar storm like 1921 or 1859, mm -hmm. those are an average of 75 years apart, and it's been 90 years since the last one. So do the math. You know, we're due for one. If right. we have one like that, it could flip in an instant to where just things fall apart quite quickly all over. And okay. so. You don't know. Uh, logically, rationally, yeah, financial crash, a bigger, a bigger Great Depression, is is a very logical outcome. I'd say that's most probable, but very significant likelihood for a solar storm, and a, and a significant but lesser likelihood for an EMP causing an attack, electromagnetic pulse attack, and that would probably be more likely in the center of the United States or over the northeastern United States. But you know. It's kind of a crap shot rolling the dice. Nobody knows until it happens. Well, there you go. We're going to leave it at that. This is a great interview, Matthew Stein. Um, and go ahead and plug your website. Yeah, the website, whentechfails.com. There's some W-H-E-N-T-E-C-H-F-A-I-L-S. There's some tremendous, totally free information. Just click on articles, you know, full grab-and-go kit lists how to purify water, protect yourself from the next superbug. Really great, totally free information. So check it out. That's great. And we posted your um, press release today with some links to stuff that we carry that, in addition to the stuff that you carry because that's what it's all about. You got to get prepared. 
and don't take it lightly because you never know. You never know when a, a land hurricane is going to come through your town. You don't That's know right. <laughs> until it happens. And then, you know, we had people calling into the show today. You know, I didn't realize how unprepared I was until, some, you know, until the power went out for five days. Now I realize how unprepared I am. So don't be those people. And with that, Matt, thanks for coming on the show, and we'll talk to you later. You're welcome. It's always a pleasure, and have a great day. Do your best to change the world, and do your best to be ready for those changes, because they're coming. There you go. Well, that was a great interview. Thank you, Matt. And uh, right here, we've got our Pro Purist is one of the fewest of the brushed metal version. Um, I would advise you, if nothing else, get your water filter, because that's you can only go three days without water. You can last a little bit without food. Um, you can last a little bit without you know, the radiation stuff, and that hasn't hit there yet, but, you know, the water, clean water is what you need to live, period. So um, get your Pro Pure filter if you haven't got one yet, or, or get another type of water filter. We also have uh, the Life Straw. It's one of the other things we carry. That's our show for today, and uh, it's been monumental. Uh, we played Alex's uh, Ask Alex, the first one. We're going to have another one coming up tomorrow and then another one coming up Wednesday. We've finally gotten these uh, edited. We thank you for sending in your questions via Planet InfoWars. And if you're not a member of Planet InfoWars, I suggest you get over there and uh, start joining up with people. I've had people contacting me. They want to get in contact with different people. And I say, you know what? Go through Planet InfoWars. That's how you're going to do it. That's how you're going to meet the people in your area that are doing the things that you're doing, that are getting prepared, that are talking about this stuff, that care about this stuff, you know? So do that. Uh, once again, we got, I'm going to throw the books up again. We got Strategic Relocations with Joel Skousen. We got a great video we're working on, on that. Uh, when Disaster Strikes. This is the handbook for the short term um, stuff, as Matt said. And then he said with the caveat, if you think it's all going to fall apart, get When Technology Fails. This teaches you how to live off the grid. The monophylin, he takes four capsules a day. Uh, a couple of the guys in the office take any. I haven't started yet, but I think I'm going to. It sounds, uh, you know, anything to get the heavy metals and stuff that we put into our bodies through the processed foods, through the crappy fluoridated water, all the stuff out there. By the way, you can get um, fluoride filters for your ProPure filter, along with the silver impregnated um, charcoal filters. There's the charcoal filters, and if you scroll up there, you got the... Uh, got the fluoride filters. So we all know what fluoride does. We've hit that nail on the head several times. And if you're uh, under a rock, it's not good for you. It's going to cause your bones to get brittle. It's going to cause you to be stupid. And uh, it's going to calcify right up there in your pineal gland, which is what some people think of as our third eye. That's our show for today. I'm Rob Dew. And we'll see you tomorrow. Alex will be here tomorrow. And he'll be on with Wayne Madsen. So stay tuned for that. And keep watching and wake someone else up and wake yourself up and that's about all I have to say. Good night.